Be honest, dude. What happens in that fight? So Haggett just called me him out, didn't he? Put him on no, no. <laughs> Come on, that, that is like should. So when I seen that, when I seen Bear in mind, he's going to bad company after this. When, when, when he when he called out Liam, I was like, oh. Gonna be awkward. I was like, this is awkward at the end of fight because I'm like, I don't, I'm, yeah, I, I, I haven't thought about. What does bungie need some money just to fuck his meal for? Yeah, it. <laughs> Andrew Tate was there, Jake Paul was there, met all them there. It was so weird. How big's Tate in real life? He's quite big, like, is it? Yeah, he's quite, all fighters do to compete two um, low overweight clash for the body comp. Then that's when they're tapping into doing big water cuts because you've got no weight to kind of pull. Mm. And then another downside to that is when you're too lean for your weight class it's happening into your muscle then so that can, can affect strength power them kind of attributes so it can go and in, go into consequences where you're getting hit so can, you know when you're dehydrated in the brain it can cause like concussions and stuff like that i think someone got eaten last year where he went for a night out and for a swim and his body was just washed up yes it's not one. what you want is it yeah. this is why i just want, i won't go in mate. Yeah. put unleaded petrol in like an f1 car like that's a ketogenic diet to fight it you know it, It'll go around the block, but it'll just gas out towards the end. Yeah. Some horrific videos of like uh, Habib. Yeah. I watched one of Masvidal who. Oh yeah, he was he's in like Abu Dhabi. Yeah. But he he came he came in late there, but yeah. he nearly killed himself yeah. in those saunas to fight that what that fight. Well, land, I was broken breast. Never had rats. I ain't trying to go back to the old me. I put my life in the life, my slam was he when I needed a homie. And there's so much pain in my heart, I ain't never seen love come show me. I've been hiding my face, cause I hate being bait. I'm like a ninja, you should know be gang. Taking riches to make some bands. I was out searching to step my peeps and where they were bashing to only friends. And dad weren't really around so so he never seemed to mention man. you you prep some of these these fighters. Yeah, so pretty much my, my job in a yeah. nutshell, yeah. Just yeah. getting fighters on weight and giving them good food and with that accent, have you got anything to do with Paddy or? No, nah, no, nah, nah. yeah, I don't work with Paddy. Um, so I started doing this when I was over in Australia. So then I've come back and then I've started working with UK fighters. So it's all like, yeah, it's a bit of a mad. We got into it like it's a bit of a mad story. I got into it, but um, yeah. So came back last year. I went back again, lived in Thailand for a couple months. I came back in February. So just because I've got more fighters over here at the moment and more events going on, because Australia's quite like quite it's it's really remote like no one really wants to fight in australia yeah, because it's yeah. just so far away yeah um so yeah, i just came back here probably going to be here till like maybe like september so time. like a bit of context for your background is as nutrition always been the passion and, and and stuff like that yeah so i did um a degree in sports science in my master's but i started off as a plumber when i left school left school like fucking no grades yeah. at all. So and then uh, just decided yeah um when i was like 20 i want to go back to college did all that and Went to uni, did a masters, and yeah. So, in terms of prepping the fighters, how did that come to be? Did you just sort of start with with one fighter getting prepped? And Ellis is obviously the fighter, but I've been around the sort of the fight game. I've got a yeah. lot of friends who, who fight, and the making of the weights obviously a little bit of a different dynamic for some people. Yeah. Um, how did you get into firstly just prepping fighters? Has that always been when, a passion? When I left uni, I had the idea like I'm going to start my business. So I'm going to work with athletes in general set up my condition nutrition page and then moved to Australia and thought it'd be this is where like you're gonna get fight you're gonna work with all athletes for like three years I just ended up fucking rounds traveling backpacking and all that nice. and then I started like maybe like three three and a half years in thought Shit, I actually need to do something here so I just started like posting loads on this page and then um a couple of local fighters started messing me saying oh do you do weight cuts and I'd always been around that team, I'd always played footy, did a bit of tie with the jiu-jitsu, and then literally just went from recommendation, recommendation, and then like two years later to nice. pretty much where I am now, yeah. Whereabouts did you actually settle then in Australia when you decided to do some work? So I've originally lived in Melbourne. Melbourne, I lived in Sydney, Brisbane, and then Perth been my home for the past four years. Is that because it's your favourite part? Nah, it's actually because... I would do. I went over on like a working holiday visa, or like the backpacking visa. Yeah. Did me two years and like I didn't want to leave. I was like, Adam, I don't want to come back to Liverpool. And then I was looking at ways to stay, and the only way to stay was to study, to go on like a student visa to get, get a couple of years. And what a lot of people do when they go out there and travel is they pick like a, a course for like a year to just extend to stay for a little bit longer. Yeah. I was like, I don't want to do that because then I'll end up being back in the same position as I was starting. So I thought I looked into courses where it could get me permanent residency and a chef is a skill over there. So if you study mm -hmm. to be a chef, 
you can get permanent residency if you study in there. So pick being a chef. So then Perth is the cheapest place to study, so we move to Perth. I suppose if you're into nutrition as well, you might as well. It's another yeah, I didn't really learn a lot, though. <laughs> Did you not? No, <laughs> that was so shit. It was, it was the worst course ever. Was it? Got there, got there the first, I always remember the first day I got there. What did the teacher you should be like, sharpen knives and fucking what other? The teacher just... was Russian. All right. So for the start, like, I remember the first day I got there, I paid all this money to come to Perth, move over, um, pay the deposit, all the visas and stuff like that. I remember the first day I got there, walked into the class, I was the only English I had there. It was like Jap Japanese, Indian, Bhutan, Malaysian. I was thinking, oh my God, I've got two and a half years of this. The teacher was Russian, couldn't understand the word I was saying. I remember I left the first day, I was like, fuck. I made the right decision here. Then the next day I come in and I see this lad walking down the corridor and he looked, he just like got an English look about someone. It's like, he looks a bit lost and went, you right, mate, you could help me. He's like, all right, mate, I'm looking for the, the commercial what cookery class. I was like, he was like a cockney. I was like, was I've got Bingo. an English lad in the class. I was like, yeah, I'm in this class as well. So I ended up making the course a lot a lot easier, but it was, it's just a money maker, the student visas over there. They just do it because they know people are going to pay. Did you, fin did you finish later. the course? Yeah, I finished it. So I'm on like my next visa now and then um, I should be able to apply for residency in like two years' time. So did you just go over there on your own? Yes, well, how did you find that? Because I'm not, I'm not good at making mates. Me, I'd probably I, I'm, I'm, really, I'm like an introvert. Really. I'm not really. Um, I'm probably better now with my job because you, always, you just have to be like yeah. a little bit. Um, what's the right word? Louder when you, with my job. But um, yeah. I just went out there and no idea what I was gonna do. I always remember like when I left, I really excited to go. I had the leaving party. All excited, left my mum and dad in the airport, really excited, got on the plane, really excited, landed there, really excited, put me bag in the hostel and sat on the bed and I was like, Yeah, what now? What yeah. the fuck am I doing? <laughs> Scary <laughs> I like, like other side of the world, isn't it? I was like, what am I doing here? Mm. I, like for the first four days, I was like a lost boy walking around thinking, like, what, what am I what, what am I doing here? It's yeah. like, oh what if if I stay a couple of months, I remember saying to myself, Oh, give myself a couple of months, at least it doesn't look really embarrassing coming home. And then you just end up meeting people. And what age were you again when you left there? Twenty six. So what's going through your head? Are you are you leaving for a reason? Are you wanting a I'd restart? Always wanted to go. I just so remember watching like Home Away neighbours and shit, and thinking I want to I go. <laughs> yeah. I want to go. <laughs> so there used to be a program. I don't think I've ever seen. It. I don't know if it's still on the telly now. It's called Wanted Down Under, and like the families go out for the week yeah. and they want to move over. Oh, yeah, and they do the switch. The and they switch. Have to hold the yeah, the flip up. card. And I was like, <laughs> I'd love to do that. I'd love to move on. You see, don't tell me you did it. No, I didn't. Do <laughs> <laughs> well, it's like, I always wanted to go, and then, um, yeah, it was really random. I would just thought, I'll just go. Yeah. And went, and yeah, six years later, I'm still there. Respect, because a lot of people do just come back, don't they? Like, yeah. I've, I've had, I've got a close friend, Sam Holmes, and he's gone out there and he's, he's really boxed it off. He's yeah. like built a life for himself, and obviously, the lifestyle looks amazing. Yeah. But you do get a lot of people who I've known who have thrown the party. Yeah. The leaving do, and then the back within yeah. six, seven weeks or whatever. I think if you, if you're not hundred percent certain of staying, or you you have you sort of like oh it's okay, people end up leaving. I think if you're determined that you want to make, because I've done all kinds of mad jobs out there just to make a living. Yeah. And I was like sweeping floors, cleaning toilets, doing just like shitty job. But you don't need to do that if you really want to stay out there. I think if you're just like yeah. I'm over there for a bit of a laugh, and you're doing that, you think what the fuck's the point in doing? Did you do all the farming and stuff? Uh, you're supposed, you're supposed to, but supposed to. I, I did a little bit. Yeah. yeah. What well, you're uh, supposed to do that? Well, you've got you meant to to get your second year. Aren't yeah, you? Is yeah. that how it works? What? Yeah, just do something. I say I did my farm work. Oh, I did. I did. A lot of people go over there and do like the under underground tunnel digging stuff. Have you seen yeah, that? Yeah, yeah. They do all, all the mine. Well, that's. I ended up having a job on the mines in the kitchens because I needed work experience for my visa. So I ended <clears> up working on like. This mining camp in the middle of nowhere, flew out to a little landing trip in the desert and then like washing dishes and making sandwiches. That's all good and well, but if you <clears> like Jack and Brad were gonna go and just do you do two weeks, twelve hour shifts underground, digging tunnels out, and then two weeks off. So you're yeah. kinda working with no life for two weeks and then you're having two weeks holiday, which would be good. But then fucking two weeks of twelve hour shifts would just kill me off and I just yeah. want to fly home. Or well, that's what like I was that. I was doing two weeks from Two weeks on, one week off in the kitchens, like twelve hour days, and then once you get back for your week, you you'd knack it for the first mm. couple of days, and then yeah, I'm still I'm interested in Australia. I'd, I'd like to go, but whilst we're setting what we've got here, yeah, see, it'd be hard to make a move. But I think that'd be a good place to set a life up. They they don't take any shit over there. The government's pretty switched on. 
Yeah, I kind of had that opinion, and then after COVID, the way they dealt with COVID, I'm like, do a bit. I don't know. I who, got a, who was on our podcast who, who came back? You remember who, who who spoke about Australia being? They were tyrants, weren't they? A little bit. Yeah, it was a little bit. I don't know. It was like everything was on the news. And it was it was just scaremongering, and mm. like, oh, should you invite people around to have vaccinated for Christmas dinner? And it was like it was really. They got obsessed with it, really. Mm-hmm. Um. It's a good place to live, but I don't even know if I'm going to stay there long term, for being honest. Just because I'm really busy over here. And I'm trying to map people like, why would you want to move back? Was just, I get a bit bored. I could, I could, I could sit, like, I was over there for Christmas and stuff, like, beach lifestyle, I can chill. But then it kind of gets a bit bored. Did you I go think. out there, obviously, single then? Yeah, yeah. And so how were the, the girls over there different? I actually met a girl out there from Rotherham. I was like, three years later, we thought, why does everyone do that when you go on holiday? There's all these fucking fit yeah. foreign birds. You just end up finding someone from your local town and uh, yeah, part and, the, and the and the um, get was someone from Rotherham and then like was with her for a few years. And then she went home. I stayed out there, but yeah, it's like all the English like stay together. Yeah. yeah, a little bit of thing in common. You're trying to build a life for yourselves out there. Yeah. And it's a bit intense. Well, like, I thought at first, like, why are all the English people within? Like, you think you move out here, you want to set into a new culture, but. Aussies are a bit standoffish. Yeah. They haven't got the same kind of sense of humour. Um, a lot of them don't really like the English, to be honest with you. Is yeah. he a big rugby league culture out there? Depends where you are. So, Western Australia is, is like AFL, so like Australian rules. So if you're in Queensland, like Brisbane's, Brisbane's really big rugby league. Sydney's quite big. Yeah. Um, so it's, it really depends where you are. Like Melbourne's really big for the Auss- Aussie rules. Um yeah, so it depends where you are. Seem to breed good athletes, Australia. I've just yeah. built into them since being kids. Like the the level of of rugby athletes there is just tremendous. Well, I, so, I I've been to a couple of state of origin games. You've seen that, that that's pretty. We're saying that tonight. I want to go watch one of them. They're yeah, went class. to that in the MSG, the Melbourne Cricket Ground, MSG, MCG. Sorry, um, that's like hundred thousand seater stadium. It was like class. What's the atmosphere like there? Class, like for the for the origin. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's just everyone's so active out there. Like I, I think as a kid, when you're a kid, you just you know, walk around the streets, get drunk in the park, and like there, the people are like they're all swimming, they're doing just such an active lifestyle for the yeah. kid. Boss, and, boss, place to go. Off, any think. crazy stories from living over there? I've had a couple of um, like camping stories where we went camping once, and it was like North Queensland, so sort of near like a rainforest area that bit. And I was with me ex girlfriend, sister, and boyfriend, and he's like proper Aussies from there. He went, we're gonna go like proper Aussie camping. Took his trailer, took his smoker, took all these uh, like just the full kit. Brought his mate to us. Got to this camping spot, and then he pulled up and said, "No camping in this spot." And he was like, "Oh fuck it!" He lifted the pole up and just threw it in the <laughs> bush. Set up gazebo like the. the the best setup you'll ever see. Did smoked ribs on this barbecue and all that. Unbelievable. And then, like, after we all got in our tents, I'm sitting there thinking, fucking hell, my stomach is in absolute bits here. And next minute, I'd say this, like, like, what the fuck's that noise? And I said to me, yeah, because I was like, what's going on? The reason why there was no camper time because it was a sprinkler system. So oh. there's, like, 30 <laughs> sprinklers. <laughs> Joe, like, Joe, my dad, you know, Joe, like, um, Someone's trying to rob a jewel and there's all the wires coming yeah. over there. It was like coming all different directions. <laughs> Everyone got food poisoned. Everyone like shit themselves. Oh. I shit myself. I mean, we all shit themselves. So we're all in this wet tent, all oh, just like yeah. violently <laughs> ill. Did, did you ride it out and stay the night or not? We had to. We actually were in the middle of nowhere. <laughs> oh, so I'm yeah. sitting in this soggy tent, just absolutely like shitting all over. Shit, shitting all over. I think, I, I exactly think I'd be a wimp with the. With the animals over there, the wildlife. You and don't like, see. Don't them. you see it? Nah, Is it a bit like, tainted a people bit? People go like, oh, yeah, what about the spiders? So I've seen probably spiders maybe. I can count on both hands in a long time I've seen them. Like mm. Snakes. I've seen two snakes in six years out, like gone past me. It's probably the sharks. You've got to be more. Yeah, that's the one. Yeah. That's the yeah. one. Like, Pierce really known for the sharks. Have you ever seen anyone out swimming or doing out in It's sick? all netted off, though, isn't it? They normally net it all off. Nah, nah. There's there's a, there's they only find certain, a way in. Well, when there's I only went... certain spots, like, there's certain beaches, like, there's a place called Cottesloe where they've got a net. But all, because Perth's just a big coastline. All oh, right, it's impossible to do. Yeah, so, um, they've got, like, a shark helicopter. Sam's been on the beach and mm. 
the beaches are evacuated, that siren goes off and you have to run out and everyone's like standing on the edge and you can see the shark like in between and stuff. No way. Yeah. And like, I, so, so get eat, like, I think someone got eaten last year where he went for a night out, went for a swim and his body was just washed up. Yeah, it's just not what you want, is it? Yeah. This is why I, just want, I won't go in, mate. Yeah. No, I won't, I, I, I won't go in in Australia now. I just bob in. I, I do it every day, like every day. I'll just bob in. I won't go for like a proper swim. Um, but everyone does it, so... I went over to Sydney with Royal Navy rugby team and we played in like military tri nations. Okay. And we went to um, HMAS Penguin, which is a Navy diving base, and they had a big jetty. And as coaches, because we we're a bit jet lagged, we were like, right, boys, in the morning, we're going to get up at five to beat jet lag. We're mm. going to go down, we're going to do a run, and then we're going to go get in water. So we were running, it was just getting light. Took us all down onto this jetty, and it didn't look safe anyway. It wasn't netted off, but yeah. one side of it was, yeah. which was like a bit of a beach side, but this side wasn't. And we were like, right, everybody in. And everyone was like, nah, I ain't fucking going in. And then one of the big, like, old school rugby players, right, I'm first. <clears throat> so he jumps in, and they, come on, everybody else in, everybody. So everyone starts jumping in. So after a few bodies got in, I thought, nah, fuck it, I'll go in. They'll probably choose someone else over me if there's sharks there. Yeah. So we're all jumping in. And then it was hard to get out ladders because there were like some, uh, what them black things called that are spiky, like little. Um, I think I know what you mean. I can't think of the, the, the little black. They're just little black shells that stick yeah, just yeah. off in the spiky, so nobody could really get out a ladder. So you had to wait for ages for people to sort of shimmy their way up. Then these two divers come running down, and they're like, "Everybody, get out water! Get out water!" So everyone's like, "Fucking hell!" So everyone's trying to fight <laughs> to get out of it. And then they were like, "We were diving here this morning at like three o'clock in the morning. And it's fucking full of sharks down here. You don't be jumping in down here." And I was like, yeah. "Fucking hell!" Imagine we'd all been eating there. Well, something happened not long ago. I think it was in Sydney where there was a diver and someone recorded. And you, all you just see is this, like, splashing of water. And this fella's just getting absolutely just eaten alive by a Savage, isn't it? I just mm. use him, yeah. The, you ain't going to beat him up, are you? So, like, no. what's... Does, I think the only person to ever beat a shark was that Paul Sykes. Yeah, we it? know Paul now, don't we? Yeah. <laughs> you know who Paul Sykes is, not really nah. well. He's like a local legend, maybe, eh? We were... Anyway, dig, in, dig, in, <laughs> dig into this. Let's talk about this nutrition. Okay. So you, you've got the degree, you've, yeah. you, you've built the passion, you've got the fighters. W with the landscape of nutrition at the minute, do you have a specific principle that you teach? Is it, um, is it varied? Do you have like sort of just... I think especially with fighters, I think it's the nutrition knowledge is, is like fairly limited. People have been fighting for years like... I work with like Liam Harrison and like he's done 100 plus fights but he's just done it a certain way and like the, the, the knowledge isn't there and yeah. in comparison to other sports like I remember being in uni and he wants to look at research into rugby league player football player there's so much research about combat sports there's absolutely nothing mm. so it's, all, it's all just like kind of passed down oh so and so did it this way he cut weight this way and then like some of the stories I hear from people that sign up or isn't it true that you should be eating this the night before? And it's just, uh, no, and it's just passed down. So it's kind of like educating, yeah, educating fighters. And like, luckily now there's a lot of research coming out, like the UFC PI and um, they're doing like thing, like things like, for example, if you had like water loading, what a lot mm. of fighters do, there's like studies there that are examining like does water loading work and how the hot baths work and stuff like that. So, it's quite an interesting space to be in now because you're yeah. getting that research from like that through. area and it's coming through and then you can apply it into your into your practice. But like in terms of sports, yeah, it's it, the, the research is so limited and people don't really know a lot in comparison to, I feel like, yeah, I feel like if you're playing football or rugby, you've got a kind of idea what to eat before training and stuff like that. But... Some fighters don't have a, don't have a clue. Yeah. Like literally, the, the, and they've been fighting for so long. Yeah, you've got the basics of that. We discussed this last night. That obviously you want to be some of these athletes and fighters are fighting to, twice a day, sometimes more, doing whatever yeah. they do to in, inside a camp. But it's also a sport that's weight dependent. Yeah. So that's a different variable. Like you mentioned, rugby. There, yeah. you, usually you probably want to be as fit and strong as you as you possibly can. Whereas this, there's yeah. a, there's that weight element and that, and because the the sport's so intense, you're having to fight. I, I was watching a, a vlog yesterday with Ryan Garcia when, oh, he, yeah, when yeah. he fought Tank Davis. Yeah. And he had a hydration clause, but he also had a, a rehydration clause. Yeah. Like, how, what, what's what, what the deal with that before we, like, dive into water? Because why? I, I think, because I'm not too sure about the, I think he was coming from a different weight class yeah, compared to, was, so, like, Ryan was heavier. So, obviously, to not gain such an advantage, he had, like, he can only rehydrate a certain percentage. Yeah. I think which is stupid because 
say you've cut any significant amount of water and then you can't rehydrate properly, then you're going into dehydrated massively. Fight, dehydrating and then that can go and go into consequences where you're getting hit. So you can, you know, when you're dehydrated in the brain, you can cause like concussions and stuff like that. So yeah, I don't get them rehydration causes. They do something similar to in one championship where you can't weigh over five percent of your um fight weight after after the fight, which makes absolutely zero sense. But I think they try and do it to be like safer, but they don't realise like fighters always trying to gain advantage. Like it's a it's inherently dishonest combat sports because everyone's trying to gain advantage. Yeah. So someone's trying to cut weight, that little bit extra weight to gain that size advantage. So putting these rules in, they're just gonna go over that hurdle and, and still do it. So it just makes things harder, really. That's the conversation that we had because you were you were like, Well, why do we even have people doing the weight cut? Why don't people just fight at the way they yeah. walk around it? Yeah. But, a fighter, especially now, is always going to want to get that advantage. So if they can yeah. cut weight and then regain it and have yeah. some extra size, they're going to do it. Well, I was I was saying this to someone yesterday actually, where like they were saying similar thing. Well, well, if you're fighting at seventy, why don't you, why don't you just walk around seventy? Well, that guy, you know, person A, he walks around the seventy, fights at seventy, he's going to be fighting person B, who typically walks around at eighty kilos, yeah. but then does like a three four kilo water cup, puts that back in, he's got like a you know three four kilo. Advantage. Mm. That's a big advantage, really, in terms of like weight and, um, yeah. I I don't think I don't think like weight cutting will ever stop. Do you be, does there seem to be different processes that people follow to make sure they'll come into that weight? So do that weight cut correctly so yeah. they're optimal for the fight. So if someone comes to me, the typical thing I I get them to do is <clears> to get like a body composition assessment. So to, to to get that is is to determine can you actually make that weight. So it's all very well saying, "Oh, I fight at sixty five, great," but is your is your body composition suitable for that weight? So, say, person A fights at seventeen, he walks around at eighty kilos, but he's got nine percent body fat. But then person B is the same weight and he's got fifteen percent body fat. He's gonna make it. He's gonna find it a lot easier to make yeah. that weight because he's actually got weight to lose. You got body fat to lose. Mm. Whereas if you what a lot of fighters do is they compete too um, low of a weight class for the body comp. Then that's when they're tapping into doing big water cuts because you've got no weight to kind of pull. Mm -hmm. And then another downside to that is when you're too lean for your weight class, you're tapping into your muscle then. So that can, can affect strength, power, them kind of attributes. So that's the first thing I'll get, like a body composition assessment. Okay, we can, we can make that weight pretty comfortably. And then we split the camp up into different stages. So... so so say someone comes and you got I've got eight weeks and I've got to lose ten kilos, for example. We do the seventy kilo, eighty kilo example, and um we go, okay, we wanna get you to within so within like six to eight percent of your fight weight, out from your fight weight. So we'll diet down to that number, so say seventy five, just by you know, a calorie restriction, and that final week is what we call like the fight week strategy. So like Dropping carbs, lowering fiber, lowering salt, and then that final like one two kilos is that that's when we start doing like a bit of a water. So cut. is that all you'd recommend doing like the one to two kilos of water cut? Yeah, so but you don't really want to be going over the research has shown like you don't really want to go over like five percent of your body weight in a water cut. So we're body water stored. I can go a bit science here if you want me to. Please do. Uh, Let's go. So um, you're around like 65 percent water. So water stored in um, three different compartments. So um, intracellular fluid, so that's fluid like in the cells of your body, and then there's extracellular fluid, so fluid in and around your cells, and then there's fluid in the plasma, which is fluid in the blood. So initially, when you begin to sweat, you lose fluid from the plasma from the blood. And the more dehydrated you get, water's getting pulled, thinking like a continuum is getting pulled from the cells. So that's when you're doing them big water cuts. You're pulling fluid from the your brain cells and stuff like that. So that that's when it leads to like you know kind of you can get heat heat stroke heat illnesses yeah. so the five percent mark is like you, we can pretty safely say that once we rehydrate you um there won't be get any kind of complications but if you're doing really big water cuts it's not just the case of you drink the fluid and it just goes back into it it takes time it goes through gradients so if you've done a really big water cut for example you've cut say seven kilos in water and you have the recommended fluid, fluids post brain. It might take you forty eight hours to get that fluid back into like your brain cells. So that's when like you've probably seen it where a guy's been clipped, and you're like, how the f how the fuck's he mm -hmm. been knocked out mm -hmm. by that? But like, 
not like all the time it might be down to dehydration, but certain certain um, scenarios. Yeah, the compromise going into the fight. For yeah, the compromise going into the fight. So um, it's always like the 5%. You don't really want to be going over that, but that's an ideal scenario for fighters. But, you know, a lot of fighters do bigger water. What are the rules for, for IVs? So is, that, is that an efficient way to get hydrated again? It's it's banned in the UFC. I I look at IVs. If you're doing the water cut safely in that way, cut safe, you don't really need it. Like if you're really like pushing it really far, then you know an IV could potentially be. But the band in the UFC, you're not allowed in the UFC. I think they're not allowed in one championship, but people do I, it. Yeah, I think people still do it. Like, mm. um, but yeah, it's just a lot of fighters just. As I said, the five percent limit, but a lot of fighters do way more than that, and that's the thing we're saying about the education. Where you know, so and so John did it. John's been fighting for twenty years, and he he's 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 never missed weight. Yeah, he's never missed weight, but as he does, he killed himself yeah. every time to yeah. do it. In so, the UFC, you see people that almost kill themselves in these saunas. Yeah. I've seen some horrific videos of like uh, Habib. Yeah, I watched one of Masvidal who. Oh yeah, he's, he was in like Abu Dhabi. Yeah, but he he came he came in late there, but yeah, he nearly yeah. killed himself yeah. in those saunas to fight that that well, fight. I think the thing is, well, luckily, like when I when I first started working in this space, I was telling fighters, "Oh, I don't think you should fight fight at this weight class. We shouldn't do that." And like the coaches, I was having arguing to coaches, yeah. and they basically telling me to fuck off because yeah. <laughs> who's this guy with his notepad and pen? Like yeah. now, luckily, people kind of listen if I, if I say yeah. it. Um, but just yeah, just passed down from from what the coaches did, and the sometimes there's a little bit of resistance to when you're saying, "Okay, we we should do it this way and this way." And like he should be cut more weight, he should be cut more water weight and stuff like that. But there's been studies that shown that the amount of weight you actually cut doesn't determine your success in the ring. So people think, oh, I've come more weight, get in, I come in bigger and that will make me more successful. It doesn't actually fully determine that. Mm. Have you got um, a feeling on being fat adapted athlete, more of a keto style diet versus being a, a, a carbed fighter? Is, is there any I science think, in that? I think keto is probably the worst diet for a fighter um, because you're doing any high intensity activity, you feel by carbs, you're not feel by fat just from a biochemistry point of view it's just you just not feel by fat yeah. you're going any kind of intensity you know 60 65 um percent above your heart heart rate max or like you know zones you know three and four on your on your pole for example you, you're burning carbohydrates so as a fighter a lot of the work is high intensity stuff so you're just not going to hit them high power outputs i always say i put a couple of posts out on um instagram for us like Put unleaded petrol in like an F1 car, like that's a ketogenic diet to a fighter. You know, it, it'll go around the block, but it'll just gas out towards the end. Yeah. So, I've had I've had arguments with people on Instagram, like, well, I I I had I I was keto for three fights and that, and then it's like keto's a bit like it, vegan. Everyone like, wants to tell you as well, don't they? It's like really, it sounds quite disrespectful. But it's like John, the amateur white collar guy. It's like <laughs> that's not like. Little fine margins doesn't really play into what when you're like the UFC don't prescribe keto diets and so like that. so the research has clearly shown that it's just not um, beneficial for that type of sport. Do you do any mapping out? So I think it will bullshit what we did. We digestive health's big for me. Yeah, as I've got a little bit older. When I was younger, I did a lot of bodybuilding, so I probably wrecked my stomach. Yeah, um, just through overeating and probably eating just way too much food. As I've got to like post 30 digestive health and gut health is like a big thing for me because yeah. you know how certain foods make you feel yeah. sleep energy all these things that are important to me now do you do any tracking for that for when making diet plans in terms of what food groups are going to be good for people or do you just sort of let them figure that out yeah so when someone signs up we try and get as much information as i can even like blood work or something that i get off fighters and um, to assess like any nutritional deficiencies and then as I said to Paul, but I don't, I don't want to completely overhaul someone's diet. So certain foods that they don't like or they're not, you don't, you know, they don't agree with certain mm -hmm. things. I won't give it to them. And, mm -hmm. um, and when them kind of um, scenarios happen where the, you know, they're getting a bit of gut problem, they're trying to do a bit of elimination. Go, okay, what's what's in the food that potentially might trigger that? Mm -hmm. um, it's quite common, especially with like female fighters, like, like gut issues. Um, but just keeping on top of things really and just assessing the diet 
taking things out and seeing what works for them. Um, especially like the high training loads and stuff like that, that can cause, you know, GI discomfort and eating in close proximity to training. So you've got to kind of do a bit of like a, what's the word for it? Um, like a bit of an examination and assess all different areas and not just go, oh, it's because of this food. Mm. It's like, okay, what time are you, what time are you eating? Yeah. Like, you know, how's your sleep being? Like, you've got to get all them factors together before you kind of go, oh, it's just that food that's that's playing a kind of role. Do you have a, a view on eating late? I have a, my lifestyle at the minute is out of sync. So uh, I'll like, I'll fast, yeah. not sometimes out of just trying to be healthy, just I'm yeah, working, just working, yeah. working, 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 and then I'll try and catch up on the calories on the night. Yeah. You just have a big 2,000 calorie table. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Just is the is there any science for eating late? Is the not not no. really. There's been see the way I look at like intermittent fasting and stuff like that. If it suits your lifestyle, and you have got that busy work schedule, etc., mm. and if it fits fits for you, great. But I wouldn't say oh the certain time you need to eat at this specific time. In terms of like the research in eating too late, there's actually studies that have shown like you have like a high carbohydrate meal. Helps you sleep. sleep. It kind of it can help you sleep, but it's it's difficult with that kind of research because it's so individualized. Like some people respond to that, some people don't. It's just probably long winded answers. Like in terms of the the fa- like the twenty four hour fast and all stuff like that, I just don't recommend that at all. It's just all this kind of resetting and detox and makes all bollocks. Huh? Yeah. One of the- my friends did a ninety went ninety two. Kieran. Yeah. Did a ninety two hour fast. Yeah. I just. When people say that, or what do you think of fasting? It's like, uh, I always ask the question, like, well, what are you actually doing it for? And they got over to detox, and I'm like, what are you actually... And they're just trying to sound like patronising. It's like, yeah. well, what are you actually... Yeah. Is there, not, the is there not some sort of research that's been done that said that it can, like, give your body time to recover your muscles? Because sh- so, your body apparently doesn't recover whilst it's digesting. Is that right? There's not any research no. on that. Not that I've seen anyway, in terms of, like, if you're... So you're doing a really hard training session and you're not having any any carbohydrates or protein, then you're delaying the recovery for the following session. So you're going to be knackered the following session. So, um, yeah, all, all them fast, but like the intermittent fasting, if you're like, you know, you've got a busy, you know, because that's a thing with fighters, they've got training three times a day, but then you've got kids and misses and you've got other things on the go. If you find that's beneficial for you to eat at a certain time, then, and we're still hitting them kind of numbers, that weight loss numbers in the fight camp, then that's cool. But um, yeah, it's just based on what, what's best. For I won't me. mention any names, but I know a lot of fighters who I'd say have a very limited understanding of nutrition. Yeah. Is there some fighters out there who just hand the reins fully over? You just overhaul this and just do whatever pretty you much, think's yeah. the best for me? Pretty much, yeah. Where you get you get a mix of things. I, I, I tend to find guys who were guys or um, girls who were at like a higher level kind of just like they just know what you give them the plan they just kind of get on with things someone who's like a lower level they're a little bit more they need a little bit more kind of attention and education yeah um and i think as well people overcomplicate nutrition and sometimes you've got to like train it out to people and Mm -hmm. go what about this you're gonna do this and then you, you you kind of kind of train out on them and especially I had a couple of females who've had like eating disorders but like really OCD and like I've given them the meal plan and like oh they haven't got they've only got light mayo in Aldi this band but you give me you told me to get this one like really obsession you gotta say right like you, you kind of train out of them so they're not so like OCD with that yeah. kind of thing where they <clears throat> they're a bit more relaxed mm. and I think that goes down to the fact where They've had bad weight cuts in the past and they've done big weight cuts, so they have to be so kind of numbers focused on OCD. Um, but it just requires education, I think. I try and give, I think, especially in, in fight camp, people do want to be educated at the same time. They have got them busy lifestyles, lifestyles and stuff. They want, they want the food to get them on weight and. Yeah that's it kind of thing like they haven't got to like i've tried to set up things in my business where we do like a weekly zoom seminar and i'll i'll teach them certain topics and that just goes down like a lead balloon yeah. because they just, just want to be told pretty just, much just, do give, me, X and just y. give me yeah. what i should eat and 
let me just get on with it kind of thing. Do you, you ever get these fighters that are just reluctant to listen to you and they're just like, they'll do a weekly check-in and they've put a kilo on and they're like, no, I've stuck to it. And then you just, it turns yeah. out it's not. <laughs> oh, 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 I, went, I went for pizza on the weekend yeah. or like, oh, my weight's not chopping. And then I see it on the story where like, <laughs> you were out somewhere like, I suppose it's the thing where you can lead a horse to water, but yeah. you got it like, I try and give a bit of flexibility in my plans where, for example, if, the, if they're hitting the weight loss targets, everything's going well. Say because Sunday, like, oh, I want to go for a Sunday lunch or something like that. I'm like, yeah, go for it. I, mm. I don't want to be really restricted with the diet because splitting that up just makes the fight camp a lot easier. If you know, on a Sunday, I'm training really hard all week, following the plan to a T, I can have that Sunday lunch with me missus and the family. It just takes a little bit of pressure off then. But then if you're not following it, then we have to be more restrictive and you can't have that time off. It just becomes a bit like, mm. fucking hell. I saw that you worked with, is it Jack Charles? If, when yeah, you're fighting in yeah, Dubai. Yeah. How does it compare working with some, he's more of an influencer yeah. you know, than, than an actual professional athlete. How does it compare working with somebody like that to a- Do you um, know what fair play too? He was actually like followed everything did to the T, like completely to the T. And I, I was surprised. Um, Cause when he first reached out and you see that influencer kind of thing and he actually did everything down to the T, did the wake up with him and all that. and. Um, I know obviously people probably don't class him at a professional athlete and stuff, but he he couldn't have done anything any different. So I was like, um, I was quite impressed to be fair with him. How did he get on? Did he fight? Was it Ant Anthony? Anthony Taylor. Boy. Yeah, That's yeah. who just beat Salt Pappy. How mm -hmm. did he get on? Because I didn't actually see the result of it. Um, it was an exhibition match. So oh, was it? it was, yeah. There was no win or he's, he's not a bad boxer, is he? I saw him when he first came off of Island doing some pads and stuff. Yeah, when he, first he, came he out, fought surprise. in the ABAs when he was younger. Yeah, yeah. So he's actually quite, he's actually quite handy, really. He's, yeah. um, he might be fighting soon. Um, might be fighting that Aaron Chalmers, I think. Yeah. Um, but yeah, that that was a mad week there. We were, Mayweather was on, and yeah, uh, like Andrew Tate was there, Jake Paul was there, met all them there. It was so weird. How big's Tate in real life? He's quite big, like, is it? Yeah, he's quite big. Um, but he was there, like, loads of security guards, and it was just a weird week of being there because he, he said <laughs> I was in living in Thailand at the time, and Jack's like, Oh, you should come out, you should come out, and I was like. Go on, I'll go up with it. It'd be a bit of an experience. And when a Mayweather's involved, I think it was basically like a rich Arab guy put a load of money into this event to get Mayweather over. Apparently, he got paid 30 million. I don't know how true that is. Tommy Fury was there. And then Jack was like the third, the third fight from, from the top. Mayweather, yeah, from the top, yeah. 30 um, million for exhibition yeah. is crazy. And then um, we went there and it was just. It was crazy. We were getting like chauffeurs round and we went to see like the Sheikh of Dubai was there. And all that. It was like so weird. And we got all the. So when Jack was on, we got like, we were part of his corn teams. We got ringside passes. Yeah. And usually when you finish, if you're in the UFC or whatever, they'll take that off you once he's finished. Because it's so unorganized event. <laughs> we still had the ringside passes, me and his, his trainer. So Jack went off to have a drink with his family and all that. We stayed ringside nice. where Mayweather was there. So like Mayweather's wife was where you were sat and like wow. Andrew Tate was over there and we just. We were just buzzing off the whole night. Yeah, but you're buzzing. You went there then. Yeah, and it made the class. decision to go. Yeah, did they? And then I had to fly to Singapore the next day, at like six o'clock in the morning. I was like, Mayweather didn't come on till three. I was like, should I go? I was like, I can't miss this. Mayweather's literally like right there. I can't, yeah. I can't, I can't miss that opportunity. It's pretty cool, like to see. It, it, it was a bit of a joke of a fight, like. Which fight was that when you were fighting? That fight chat. That oh, dead Jim. Yeah. For... He was just saying, oh, yeah, 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 yeah. After like three yeah. rounds, I was like, mm, maybe we should go now. Do you think he even <laughs> went through gears there, Floyd? No. No, no, no. Just steady away. Yeah. He didn't come out for ages too, and people, the crowd are booming him and all that. Because <laughs> they were waiting for because he... Just does what he wants. Yeah, because apparently he didn't want to come out. This is what I've heard. He didn't want to come out because Tate was there, or someone was, or, or Jake Paul was there, and he wanted to be the the center of attention coming out or something like that. But mm. it was like, yeah, that celebrity boxing kind of world. I was like, this is just weird. Who is the highest level fighter that you've got the chance to work with? Um, Probably Liam and John Haggerty, probably yeah. the two biggest fighters. Be honest, dude, what happens in that fight? So Haggerty just called Liam out, didn't put he? him on this no, time. No, <laughs> come on. That is like, should, so when I seen that, when I seen Bear in mind, he's going to bad company after this. Eh? When, 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 he, when he called out Liam, I was like, oh, gonna be awkward i was like this is awkward if they end up fighting because i'm like i don't I, yeah I, I i haven't thought about what it, does like bunging you some money just to fuck his meal yeah, but... <laughs> it's like so obviously I've got, it's weird because i've got like loyal like loyalty to liam bad company working people from bad company and then john working it's like 
yeah, that's it. I hope it doesn't happen, to be honest. Really? Do, so do, do, do you think it will? It's potential, though. Yeah. I mean, Liam's uh, still, a, still injured, Liam. Yeah. He's still got a bit of a bad knee. Because I've got, I got a good... I get on really well with John, get on really well with Liam, speak to Liam a lot, speak to John a lot, so it's like... It'd be an exciting one to watch, I know that. How old is John? 26, So he's young, eh? Yeah. But uh, that fight with Nongo, that was, that was crazy, though. I didn't... Mm. Yeah. Didn't... I, say I, didn't get, I, I did think he was going to... I just had a feeling. I, I, I had a bet with Joe about it. I don't know if you mentioned it. He, like, he was like, I'm not, he's not going to win. I was like, yeah, he did mention. He's going he's gonna, he's gonna, he's gonna to win. He's like, I bet you're 100 quid. I was like... like and then the next one, I text and saying, transfer, tra- 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 transfer that over with the meal plan when he's two, mate. And he's like, <laughs> yeah. what are you on about? And I check, check Instagram. And he was like, oh, I've just woken up and I lost 100 quid. Like, so he weren't expected to win that fight in any fashion? Not by, like... like Loads of people saying, "Oh, he's got no chance, got no chance." But maybe because I'm biased because of work, them, I just had the feeling that he was going to yeah. win. I just, I don't know. I, I yeah. Um, but it, it, like people probably class it as like one of the biggest upsets. But yeah, h- him and Liam fighting that'll be. Yeah, be yeah. Joe thing. mentioned in terms of it, fighting over it, probably for like big stadium. Or maybe is would he, would he toying with that idea that it'd be a huge, yeah. huge fight? I I I don't see it happening personally. I don't know why I just concede something. Do you think timing's just off? Yeah. Well, I think Haggett is on his way up and he's probably going to yeah. get up there and he's going to stay up I there. I think Liam will have to have a warm up fight first. I think yeah. if he went straight into, ah, uh, yeah, it's uh, they're both unbelievable, so it's hard to really. Yeah, it's, I think John's planning on fighting. Um, spoke to me the other day potentially in August time, so. Yeah, maybe the end of the year, but wow. I just, in a way, I just it's so it's, mm-hmm. it's, it's, it's just a shit scenario for me because it's like I don't, I don't know what to do. Would you have to? You obviously, you'd work with both. I don't. I don't. I really don't know. I don't know how that would work. Who signs biggest check? Because eh? someone, someone, because <laughs> someone said to me, "Have you ever worked with anyone who's fighting each other?" I was like, "Nah, it's never happened." I think that what what an op, what a mad scenario that would be. Like them two fighting, so like I, I just don't. Yeah, it's a weird one. I suppose. You could do both because it's not like you're the head coach the, in terms of think, tactics. You just you you get them there healthy yeah. on way. I just and think rivalry. I think you're in a camp with someone. That's like the team, isn't All it? Right. You're part of the team. Yeah. So you're working jump, with two of them from circle to circle, people will be thinking, "Oh, he might be." So say, who, so who, he we, might be who telling are we picking them, then? <laughs> <laughs> you get no it's comment. Like, <laughs> <laughs> but it's like because you're in a camp, like with Joe, like you're part of that team, so. Yeah. It'd be, is he going to, is he telling them all this way? So, yeah, I, I, yeah, I don't know. Have you yeah. worked much with any of the UFC fighters? Yeah, so I've got a couple of lads in the UFC. Jake Hadley, um, from Birmingham. I've got a lad from Perth, Jack Della. Um, he's just got into the top 15 of the welterweights. He's like unbelievable. He's only 25. He's won first four fights all first round um, wins. So, um yeah, pretty cool. I went to the UFC in Singapore last year. Like this, like literally this time last year, I was there. Who was the main card for that? It was um, Tex Glover Tex era and oh, yeah. um, what's the Polish blood? Um, um, Blovich. Yeah, yeah, Yeri. Yeri. Oh, okay. Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. yes. And then that um, Joanna and um, what's a Chinese girl called? Wheelie, is it Wheelie? Yeah, yeah. Probably. Yeah. That was a really good card, that, to be fair. That was a class week. I had, I had a lad on the road to the UFC tournament, like a tournament to get UFC contract, and then I had Jack on. And, like, yeah, it was my first UFC event. It was pretty cool. Like, UFC, this Jitchy, you go to the UFC hotel, and there's, like, 100 staff. You get a little chaperone. Oh, can you get some more towels? You go, I'll get you more towels. Like, I've never cut weight like this before. So, mm-hmm. <laughs> usually in someone's, you know, bathroom or you know, the local sauna, and they like, I had everything for you. Are they the premium organization, would you say? Yeah, 100%. By a, by a country mile? What a bit. Well, I went to one championship last in November with John. It's a it's a big setup, but it's just not, they haven't got the PI there. Like, UFC PI's got all the training facilities. You've got a nutrition team. So I, I I work with the head of nutrition for the UFC. Like I speak to him quite regularly. So if I've got a fighter on, I say, right, Jake's Jake's coming here on fight week. Here's his numbers. This is the food he wants. All so sorted. All out. So wow. all the fight week food. I don't literally don't have to do anything. Class. And they they run if they they've seen there with the plunge and the 
Yeah, uh, yeah, so the tub and the saunas yeah. and all stuff like that it looks the right set up. So literally, like, yeah, if you've got a fighter on the UFC, I'll just message Charles on WhatsApp and say, hey, he's come, he's flying to Vegas. Um, this is number. These are the food he wants. This is um, his post weighing preferences. Sweet, that's it. I don't really have to do anything. Who's your dream fighter to work with? It's got to be McGregor. Um, I don't know. You know. Israel would be good Adesanya yeah being Australia based depends what vibe on I'd like to work with someone like Sugar Sean or something yeah, yeah. Sure. it's weird because I think like a couple of years ago you just said I'll be working with Liam and John and all these like I think oh, something like six or seven world champions now and like you said to me two years ago I'd be like you just absolutely said no chance and like now so it's sort of taking things as it comes nice. like, yeah um, it'd be cool to go I definitely want to go to the UFC PI this year and visit that. Um, I'm going to one championship next week. So, so you flying out there because Amber's? No, so I've got uh, Amber's on this Friday. So right. I've got two lads on, um, on the same card on the 23rd. Um, Nathan Bender and Nico Carrillo. So, um, yeah, flying out next Tuesday to help them with the weight cuts, which is um. I bet, it's quite, a, I bet it's a cool lifestyle what you've got. Just, just, like, just taking it in what you're telling me now, getting to travel here. Yeah, there, and... like last year I I went. I went everywhere. Like I was in like Abu Dhabi, Dubai, Singapore, lived in Thailand for a couple of months and did all the weight cuts in Thailand, see how the tires did it. So I was just like, a, last year, I was just like a sponge. I wanted to travel as much as I could mm. and go to as many events and just see how, you know, because it's very easy to see the like, online nutritionist and do this. It's very easy to give a meal plan to someone online and go, there you go. It's, it's a completely different scenario when you're there. Mm. The stress, the emotions, you're gauging things, like the language you use to fighters, you know, you, you don't know that until you're actually there in person. So I like, was quite lucky last year to go to like the UFC, the big events, the one championship, because until you're in that high pressure environment, you don't really, you don't really know. Mm. Um, and is it like I, I said, like language is really important because some fighters, I've said things like, off the cuff and, and it's affected someone's mood. So it's a change of mood and you realise you need to be careful what you're saying in these kind of scenarios where like the cutting weight you got, oh, it'll be, for example, I think I said once, oh, and this might be a bit hard. And then that, oh, it's going to be hard. And yeah. like Joe, just a little, just one way can change everything. And then you know now, okay, well, I know I need to like, for example, a fighter, I need to just be a little bit quiet, not saying anything. Some guys, when we're cutting the weight, you need to be really chatting with the mate, like with Joe, making jokes, um, putting like 80s music on Joe. And then some guys you just know to be mm. a little bit more uh, like a lower ta- kind of tone. So yeah, like last year I was just like a sponge just doing all that and learning. Um, and I think with my job too, I'm always learning. Like I don't know all the answers to things, but like I'm just continually learning and trying to get better in my practice and, what things can I do a little bit better to get that fighter, that little one, two percent? You mentioned better. there you're a sponge, you've been at the all these locations around these elite fighters. Do you have anyone specifically who springs to mind who's a mentor for you, whether it be from afar, books, podcasts, is there anyone uh, who you really I love like? I love my stoicism. Okay. Ryan Holiday and like the Daily Stoic and yeah. all that. I like a mad into all. Do you know Paul Check is? No. No. He's he's good to check yeah. out Paul Check. Check Institute is his business. Okay. Yeah, like the Daily Stoic, Ryan Holiday. Um, I've been getting into like my Chris Williamson podcast at the moment. Mm, check that out. Who's that? Chris Williamson. I think he was like, I think he was a Love Island, but he's turned into like this kind of like, I won't say a guru guy, but he gets all like good. He's had like Jordan Peterson on and stuff like that. Jordan's good, eh? Yeah. yeah. He's I'm intense, but he's Jordan, good. Jordan Peterson and. Tim Ferriss is a good guy. Tim. Good one, listen to. Yeah. Um, Have you got his book Tools of Titans? Yeah. yeah. Well, the first book I ever bought from Tim was it the Four Hour Work Week? Yeah. But I just used to think, what the fuck? Yeah. But I couldn't wrap my head around like the, the leverage and this, that, and the yeah. other. But there's some there's core stuff in it. But the Tools of Titans was a good book. Yeah. I, I I like I sort of kind of applied the principles of Four Hour Work Week to me, where like I have. I'm really lucky where as long as I've got my laptop and my phone, I can literally go, okay, I'll go, I'll go there. So yeah. I've made my, I've sort of structured my business around where, like, originally I was going to get an office and stuff like that. Like, 
don't really need to. True. I can, you know, tomorrow if I wanted to go and live in Thailand for coming, I can do. Yeah. So I've built me business around where I've got that freedom to move around and that benefits my business because I can go to them fights because I'm not like, oh, I've got a... Even you're in person it, there, you can network, you're speaking to other people. Yeah. It only benefits your business, your yeah. brand. Yeah, because um, I think especially when you... Like, I'm 32 now. When I came home, all my friends have got, like, kids, yeah. mortgages, and they're like, oh, you should get your own plate, or oh, you should get this, you should get that. I'm like, nah. Nah, I don't need to. Like, mm. right, I'm back in, I'm back in my mum dad's house at the moment because a, there's no there's no, there's no, no point getting somewhere or tying yourself down because I I won't have that opportunity. You're on to, your path as well. You shouldn't have yeah. to look left and yeah. right. I, I get like that, and we had this conversation yesterday that even with the podcast, as, as we grow and develop this and, and, and push it, we want to be able to potentially move around. Obviously, we're in Castleford yeah. now. There's not yeah. there's not endless opportunity around where we live, but yeah. the ability to put yourself out there and be known and, and, and build a business and a brand, you, you can then move wherever you want. And I yeah. think that's an ambition we've sort of got as well to yeah. speak to people like yourself, but we can go all over and do this. Yeah. Don't have think, to just hide in one location. I think a lot of people have just got the shoulds, haven't they? Like, people who have been in... I, I, this is not no disrespect for people who, you know, who have grown up with or lived around when you when you go away from home you just get a completely different perspective and yeah. you come back and you look at them and think it's that you know people are happy and you've got kids and families and stuff like that and you think that's not necessarily the full the path that you have to go and you go a different kind yeah. of path and um i'm a bit of like just a bit of a floater at the moment I, like australia's my kind of home but then england's kind of my home but I'm not kind of putting pressure on myself to mm. determine when... Just explore what happens. Yeah, explore what happens. Yeah, as, long, as long as I'm happy, the business is growing, I, I feel like I'm making progress. I know it'll kind of... You mentioned word of mouth there has, has spread the message of your, of your business. Do you put a lot of focus into social media? Are you putting content I, out there? I think stuff? content for me is one of my biggest things. I, I've known that that's what's grown my business a lot, putting good content out there. And it's always take a lot of time to, to create good content yeah. and what little tweaks can we make on the po even something similar as you know where's the logo situated on your reel or what what font you use and mm. like all the time because i look at like instagram is that's like your shop window mm. people look at you and go okay why should i come to him mm. and I, i've got a bit of a business mentor and he always says to me every time you post what is the purpose to post what are you trying to sell even on your stories what what what's the point of doing that are you, you not like you, you're trying to sell something all the time, but there's got to be a point to it. And um, over over the months and last couple of years doing that, that's been like a big focal point to me. Because you've probably seen where people put like fitness facts, like the, the benefits of vitamin C. And you think, who the fuck wants to know that? You know what yeah. I mean? You want to, you, what does this fighter eat? How can I make weight this way? Yeah. The benefit, like, Understood. you just see so many fitness facts and it's just like, everyone's doing the same thing. You need to be a little bit different and eye-catching and appealing. So I'm always thinking of new things. Like, when and I go is that, away... Is that all run by you then, the creative yeah, bit yeah. is all coming from yeah. there? Yeah. So I'll, I'll, when I'm away somewhere, so when I'm going to Thailand next week, I'll just record everything. Not necessarily with an idea what I want to do, like every time the lads on the pads, yeah, I'll record it. That's the one. If they're eating, I'll record it. If I'm traveling on the coach with them, I'll record it. Because then I'll think of something in my head and go, oh, I've got that content there. And then come up with a reel, go, oh, what to eat in Thailand when you're cutting weight? So you've got that content there. Yeah. So just get everything and then that'll come to you a bit later on. You just said then about pointless, you see pointless questions like yeah. what, what benefits of vitamin C? Yeah. This is just a selfish question, selfish question for me because I don't know what rule to follow and I can't be asked researching it. Yeah. You, he always gets into my ribs about not having enough salt because I sweat loads and yeah, I don't yeah. put much salt in. So I've started having more pink Himalayan salt and I'll like I'll put like two grams in one of my one and a half litre bottles of water. Yeah. Then one of these old school gym boys here called Paul, he said to me, I have 20 grams of salt a day and that's what you need to fucking feed your brain. And I'm like, 20 grams is a lot. It's a lot. Of am I gonna, if, I, if I follow his <laughs> advice, am no. I going to be poisoning myself or and what? You end up pissing a lot. Like, you, yeah, that's not... No. No. What would you recommend if you do if you do recommend any? In terms of like um you don't necessarily need to put salt in your drinks. Have like electrolytes if you're training on you're a bit of a heavy sweater. Just put electrolytes in your drink. One. It's gonna be a lot tastier than just having salt in your drink because it's gonna taste like fish water and um, seawater. Um it just really determines on are you, are you a heavy sweater when like you train? When I train, yeah. Yeah, yeah. heavy compared so to like... like have you seen like the SIS tablets? No. So this one that I always recommend to, to fighters because it's just, you can get them from the supermarket. 
just put like a tablet of that in um, in your post training drink or even the drink that you're taking to train and just replace them electrolytes because when when you lose water when you sweat you lose water and electrolytes but then you lose more water than electrolytes so you've got to um, so if you're just drinking pure water you just end up like does it, does it have well like now. a diuretic effect then? So you, it just gets used to just flushing that water out. Is that what? Yeah. So it? like, if you you're not replacing, so say for example, so when you sweat, fluid comes from the blood, use water and let's say. So when you're just putting that water in, you're kind of diluting the blood. So what then the kidneys end up doing? If you, especially if you drink it too quick too, you end up pissing quite a lot of that out. So you need the electrolytes to maintain that electrolyte balance in mm-hmm. your body. Um, but what a lot of a lot of fighters do even like I give an example post weighing you weigh in and they just neck like two liters of water really quick waste and then you just the kidney just go shit because the the body's got like a, a balance between water and electrolytes so if you're overloading with fluid the the kidneys go shit we need to get that balance back to that level so yeah. you just end up pissing loads out. Mm. Um, yeah, even just like a electrolyte tablet. So don't be doing twenty grams. Maybe. Twenty grams, maybe, yeah. maybe twenty two. grams. Yeah, you'll notice <laughs> if you're having like quite a lot of salt, you'll you'll, you'll hold on to a lot. We've noticed if you've been to you had like a Chinese meal the next yeah. day, you've been like, Fuck, I'm two kilos heavier because yeah. the, the, the sodium content, and also you end up probably urinating quite a lot just to get rid of that salt. So putting business aside, I've got a question for you. What do you do in your free time? I just work. That's what <laughs> but the thing is though, like, I seen a, I seen a post the other day. This guy we that Alex Hormozy. Yeah. And, he, like, talks, like and he talks about like, I work all the time. That's his but hobby. People, that's his hobby. Yeah, that's it? my hobby. That, that, that's <laughs> like, I look at my hobby. I enjoy what I do. Yeah, well, like that. So people go, well, you should work. I, was like, well, I enjoy doing it. So, <clears throat> yeah. Um, pretty much work. It's yeah. endless doing what we're doing because you, you've got your profession there, which is your nutrition. But yeah. especially if you're building a brand and, and yeah. a, a, it's never ending. Yeah. It, I look at it as like, it's, a, it's like my baby. Yeah. Like this, I think where it started. And you and you you look back and think I've built this to this point. You it gives you that motivation. Go like, what's the, what's the next stage? What's the next stage? And like, I think sometimes you've got to distinguish between like always trying to get better, but then your happiness is not determined on whether your business is is yeah. growing. But like, you've still got to have that kind of ambition to keep on pushing, which I think I struggled with like the first year or so of doing my business. When I was growing for this is gonna make me happier. And then I realised I was getting these goals. But I was determining my happiness on my business goals. What was that more of a I can relate to that. More of a you had a financial goal in your head. You hit that financial goal and then like that, that. I just thought like, oh if I if I work with these fighters, right. I'm gonna be I'm gonna be really happy. Yeah. And then like you hit them goals or you go to the UFC and you're like, well nothing's really changed and you're putting your happiness on like hitting these goals and trying to get in that, like being happier than yourself, but also having that ambition to push to get them goals, but it's not determined on your happiness kind yeah. of thing. So what is your North Star then? You mentioned hobbies and stuff like that. Do you have a North Star in mind of what you're aiming to get? See, I've got a, a different opinion where people have got six, one goal, year goal. Mine's just like the past couple of years, it's grown because I've just put myself out there and just, not really just set any specific targets. Yeah, just trust just carry the process. On, yeah, trust the process, carry on working hard. And then I feel like them scenarios just place themselves in front of you. And yeah, I couldn't turn around and say, oh, yeah, in this two years' time, I want to have like this and this and it's this. probably key that because you can set all these outlandish goals, but ultimately if you're just happy yeah. in the day and working hard yeah. and pushing towards something that's of meaning to you. Well, I think if you put way- like arbitrary timelines on things where you go oh this time in six months i want to i want to work with a a world champion for yeah. example well then if you don't hit that in six months what are you going to be miserable and think oh it hasn't it hasn't worked out like mm. you're putting like uh, so i think it's got to be very, very you got to be very specific if you're setting like a real timeline thing not just like oh and so you know, you're trying to fill the gaps of oh yeah i want to i want to do this in this time because then if you don't hit it you're like, oh, I, f- I failed. Or and it's hard for you to pivot as well. If you set your goal to be in six months to be somewhere yeah. and something changes or you lose yeah. interest a bit. If you haven't set that end, I mean, always set an end goal. There's always something yeah. you can work towards, but being able to pivot, like you said, and it, it's similar to not having a base that you've got so that yeah. if something changes or someone yeah. says, come out to Thailand, you can pivot and do that. It's a similar basis. Well, I think as well, like this, if you just said to me this time, 14, 12, 14 months ago, You'd be back in the UK and consider living here and doing that. I'd have been like, absolutely no chance. I was I was settled in Perth. Business was going was growing. 
had my first couple of guys in the UFC, and then one day I was like, oh, I want to go. I'm, like, I haven't seen my family in three years because of COVID. And I went back, and this is the thing about like not setting specific goals. I had a guy fighting for the world title over here. Went to it, seen like the buzz of it. I was like, oh, I want to, I want to stay here. But yeah. if I wouldn't have had that random like like impulse of going home to visit my family, it wouldn't have led to this, it wouldn't have led to that. So like, it's all sort of like fell into place kind of thing. And then let's say if you'd have set a goal to work with the world champion in Perth, yeah, you'd have come back and had that experience for, no, can we goal still to be back yeah. in Perth and you wouldn't want it to yeah. stop something back. Uh, yeah. yeah, I just think like, yeah, setting them kind of arbitrary goals, just all the timelines, just, you end up, if you don't hit them, you just, you feel disappointed and you, you shouldn't really, yeah. Might, 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 I might be doing it the wrong way, I don't know, but just like, yeah, everyone, that's kind of whatever works for yeah. you. Yeah, there's a thousand ways um, to skin a cat. Yeah, just um, just keep on growing. I know if I'm like improving, getting a little bit better and, you know, learning more things, improving me speaking, improving, like little like things for me, is like, can you convey the message yeah. properly? I think that's a big thing as well. Can you actually talk about the topic properly? And yeah. I'm at the moment I'm doing a public speaking course to try and get better. How do you find speaking in public groups like that? Um, you do I seminars. Don't mind, I, I don't mind. I don't know if you like, said to me a couple of years ago, I've been like absolutely no chance. Yeah. But now I think when you've got that kind of inner confidence, like you know, you know your you, material, you, you know, know your material, you do it. You you like talking about fight week and nutrition is like it's my daily thing so mm. i should be able to talk about yeah. it properly just little things like you know, how you know can you wear things better should i have said this a little bit better just yeah. little things like that really i've got a bit of a selfish question bring it back to fighting i've brought it up a couple of times on a podcast and it seems to be something that fighters don't think about in terms of the sport that they do taking damage to the brain obviously it's a sport where the opponent's trying to knock you out or finish you and that's just the game they're in. Yeah. Is there anything that fighters can do to to limit that to any supplements or any protocols that people do to make sure they're protecting the brain? Um, it's been a bit of amazing research with creatine on like brain health. Um, it's quite early days, mm. but showing that it can um, have like cognitive benefits of it. Also, when you've got a um, traumatic brain injury or you've been you've been concussed there's been research showing like creatine fish oils because fish oils got anti-inflammatory properties um but in terms of protecting the brain for fight it's quite a difficult one because if you if have you heard the cte yeah like, and, like, this is what we're getting at yeah, there's been like, a lot of the research N in the i studied NFL, the nfl yeah. a lot about yeah that, like, and, and i watched the film about it and they like examined a couple hundred um, fighters, um, NFL players, brains, and a lot of them. But you can't, they can't diagnose that until you. Yeah. When it like until, micro fracture of the skull, yeah, like, like or just ta inflammation of the brain. It, like it's a thing called like a build up a tau. Did you it's ever watch that story on that? Do you know Junior Seau is an NFL player? And I know him because when I went to LA, I ended up like being friends with his daughter, Sydney. And then their friend said, oh, you, you might know her dad is called Junior Seau. And I looked to it, who won. There's a documentary out on him. And he were a big NFL star and he were just known for just coming in with big head collisions in defense. Yeah. And, so, and and he had a perfect marriage um, with Sid and his mum. Three good kids, a lot of money. And he just shot himself in the chest outside their house. Mm. And he had no yeah. like yeah. mental health. He didn't ever talk about it or there were no signs whatsoever. They did a scan on his brain after and he had a lot of CTE. Yeah. The NFL tried to ban it. Because yeah. there used to be, you mentioned there, helmet to helmet contacts. So that's what they used to teach. Yeah. So the collisions would be helmet to helmet. Yeah. And they've took that out of the, out of the sport now because I think there were a lot of people who came out of the woodwork and the NFL tried to sweep it under the yeah. rug a little bit. There's like, a big, I haven't seen the foot, there's like a film. Will one, Smith there, plays the yeah. doctor in it, yeah. Um, I suppose in like combat sports, the only thing you need to do is like, you know, kids wearing head guards and stuff until maybe later on. It's quite in it. <laughs> I'm dragged to some of these gyms to sort of like, I do a little bit of documentation for fighters and I've got yeah. a lot of friends who do it. And some of these spars, you know, just taking yeah. damage. I, just, I look at it like, that's why I'm not a fighter. I look at it as like, whoa. Yeah. These it's, boys are taking serious head trauma. You could imagine there's definitely some kind of, you know, it would be naive to say there's not some kind of effect if you've had a prolonged career getting yeah. elbowed and kicked in the face take the strikes out of it it's not like you can yeah. manage the 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 combat it's yeah. just that's just what they do whereas in rugby league now they're almost trying to change the sport a little bit yeah uh i remember when our young guard watched it, it 
people get concussed or knocked out and carry on playing. Yeah. Like that's just not a, <laughs> yeah, you're wild. just like, yeah, magic sponge, get yourself back out there, may get stuck in. And yeah. so I feel like people can learn from it. Yeah. But I suppose in fighting, it's such. You think the amount of people have probably been just knocked out and just, you know, finished the fight and gone out of, gone out of the bevy in the pub. Yeah. And like, there's yeah. so many things that you need to, you know, yeah. to rest up. You need to manage your nutrition, look into like things are so much like creatine official, official. But a lot of fights is, oh, I get sparked out, I'll go to the pub. Yeah. And like, you don't know the impact that's had to. Yeah. Not only have you done that, then you're going to dehydrate your brain for alcohol. Yeah, it's, it's like, just, it's a vicious um, cycle. And then imagine you're doing that over the case. The, the course for like 10, 15 years. Mm. It's, um, I think it's it's probably easier to control at like, say like a fighter gets knocked out in UFC, at least you've got that UFC PI team to manage that and give them recommendations. But it's just, it's like John on the regional scene. He gets knocked out, he's, he's not going to have a clue. Yeah, yeah, he's not going to have a clue. Oh, I'll just have a drink after it. It's a hard one, really. He mentioned that Phil Bennett, like a, I shouldn't laugh, but it's a funny story. He uh, did a white collar and got, Buzzed up, like I'll, we'll put the fight on here. Wait, when the fuck did Phil Bennett do Phil can do a bit of boxing. Can he actually? Can Phil can do a bit of boxing. Well, young Butterbean. And in he in he, in he fought um, Wayne Price's dad, or Summit Price's dad, um, I believe. It's, and he got like lit up, yeah. but he didn't go down. And he had a vicious concussion. I remember him telling the story. Like yeah. he's similar boat to you there where he said he probably just went out and celebrated and boozed. I think he got beat on points, but he says that it would just... I didn't even feel like I were on yeah. the planet for forty hours. Yeah, like his brain must have been rattled that much from the from the contact. That's it. And then like, there's been things where like that's carried on for yeah years, or you yeah. know they permanently getting headaches and um yeah, it's a hard one. It's very, and like I said it's very hard to control. Yeah. I suppose with like every fighter. I suppose these fighters who are pursuing a career. Yeah, and there's and there's clout and there's and there's money attached to that then there's a justification for me there but you see a lot of these people yeah. who do these these white collars and i've been asked to do it like a couple of times so i just don't see the the risk to reward well, there's also yeah. like sub concussive impact so not even like a hit to the head but like just just jolts the body that yeah. even them sub concussive impacts and have a um an impact mm. um so it's not even like necessarily yeah it's not necessarily getting punched in the head it's just like you know getting hit in the body, just that jolting kind of thing. Yeah, respect to any fighter, they've got absolute minerals to just step yeah. in there. It's such an unbelievable thing that they do. Yeah, definitely. In any, in any level. Yeah. When you're going to, I always say that it must be some buzz to pick one date in yeah. the calendar and know that everything's building to that and there's yeah. another man or woman who's decided on the same day to show up and train for it. Yeah. I've had street fights before, but it must be so different when you know there's a date in the calendar yeah. and they've trained. Yeah. And you're gonna see who's best. Like, definitely. it is the best sport. Like, yeah, combat definitely. sport in general. I'm just a big fan of it. Yeah. Because so you, you have to respect what those people do, at that level. Yeah. So definitely. God knows what it must feel like when you're going and watching these UFC fighters and one championship yeah, at the especially pinnacle. Especially training and stuff, and you watch them. Yeah. It's um, it's pretty. It's pretty cool. And especially like that. That's like your job as well. It's like yeah. It's what a job. Have, yeah. When did you actually decide that you wanted to specialize in fighters for nutrition? I just started getting more fighters and then I just think like, right, well, I wanted, this is when I started working like a friend, he was like a business mentor and he was talking about, you know, if you've got your Instagram page and stuff, you're targeting all different, you're targeting Karen and you're targeting the, the, the person who wants to lose weight or you're targeting John who's the rugby player and you're targeting fight, like the message is going to just get diluted and I, I started getting more interested in working with fighters too, so... We just like just narrowed it down it and just niched, niched it down. down. Just niched it down. So like at least you know when I post something, it's about fight. Well, this is a couple of years back. Like it's all about fighters. And then my love for the sport, like I always watched it, but I I was interested in every kind of sport, like football. Like hardly watch football anymore. So it's like my passion has grown and grown and grown even more into the into the fight game. Mm. And I think you just if you if you if you're trying to appeal to everyone, your message just gets di diluted when you initially start and something. I think. Anyway. Yeah, I agree with that. I think niche down to begin with. Then once you've got the phone, then you can sort of yeah. maybe expand on some of the but topics like, that interest you. People like will message me from like general public, and I just I don't enjoy doing it. To be honest, yeah. I, I find as well. They never listen to you. Never listen, <laughs> and they haven't got at least a fighter's got a target. I yeah. need to make weight on the twelfth of August. 
what we're talking again about arbitrary things. Oh, I want to lose weight in six. I want to lose two kilos in six months. Yeah. There's no. But I also want two takeaways a week. Yeah, and then you know, it could be easy. I could easily take money off these people, but I just don't. I don't enjoy doing it's not, it. It's not fun for you. It's not. It's not fun for me. Like a fighter, every fight is different, and then everyone's got different personalities. Well, which is pretty cool. And, yeah, just general public just don't interest me at all. When I mentioned uh, Phil Bennett there, Phil Bennett's close to Tyson Fury. Okay. And I think it's George Lockhart, if I can get the name right. Who, yeah, he's one like the old, like, original. old school yeah. originals. Um, but they go and like live. So when Tyson's yeah. in camp, it, I think George gets flown in and that's pretty much one-on-one, live with me for eight, 12 weeks, whatever. The, would you ever yeah. do anything that intense or you like yeah. to work from afar a bit? Yeah, if that opportunity came about, there's something that I'd potentially consider. Um, I suppose as well with like Tyson Fury and the boxing. I suppose boxing's the bit, probably the, the combat sport where the most money's involved. Mm. And, you know, I wouldn't potentially say no to it if it, that opportunity came about. It'd be pretty cool to do it. Like, I've got me, me chef qualification and I'm pretty, even though I didn't I learn fuck all when I did my chef course. But, um, I you know, basic. Cook, yeah, I can still cook and stuff like that. But, um, yeah, it'd be pretty cool to see that thing. When I watch the UFC sort of embedded and you see your likes are just engaged, that seems to be when they get to a certain level of notoriety and they've probably got the financial backing. Yeah, that's the yeah. first thing they, they usually do is get that food dialed in. Yeah. And that'd be such a, a sweet thing to have if you had someone who, A, knew the what to eat book and could do it for you. Like, that'd be probably my first. Oh, yeah. If I had like an unlimited it's, budget, that'd be my probably first. It takes away the do. stress, doesn't it? If you yeah. know you're coming in, you've got your, your smoothie there, you've got yeah. this, like, you don't have to do anything, do That'd you? That'd be the dream, won't it? You said you've got Amy making your bacon exercise on the morning. <laughs> we'll she get there, though. She, she, she's, she's willing to do it. She just hasn't quite learned, I want to be optimal, not just have bacon yeah. and exercise yeah. and lasagna every night. You know what I mean? It's, <laughs> we'll get there. Yeah. Um, go on, you got a question? I was just going to say, what do you recommend for like, not average Joes, but you know, people like me and Josh who train five, six times a week, dabble a bit in, well, I dabble a little bit in doing boxing and stuff like yeah. that, and then just weights and S&C. What sort of diet would you say to be focusing on? I don't want to uh, I don't want to get shredded, but I don't want to get uh, massive. I just trying wanna... to get a free plan here. So. Um, I'm not trying to get a free plan. <laughs> I suppose that's really a hard, a hard thing to give, like a specific kind of plan, really. I think the principles are, you know, keeping your protein intake high, probably at least above, um, two grams per kilo a day. Um, making sure you're having you know, lots of carbs around your training session, you're doing anything like high intensity, you know, you're boxing, you want to fuel for that session. So making sure you're having, you know, carbohydrates, close proximity training, drinking enough fluids, you're getting good sleep. The thing is you're getting them principles, right? Get the um, basics. It's like kind of hard to say like, why well, you should be having like X amount of calories, but yeah. kind of the protein, protein's important. Um, I, sh- I struggle with protein. Did you say two grams per kilo, kilo of body weight? Yeah, so, so whatever so, your body so, weight is down to. So I need like 180 grams of protein pretty much. Yeah. I struggle to do that because I have probably four or five meals a day. You would yeah. slam two shakes in at 50 grams. That's all you need there. to do. You need to get shakes in. Yeah, well, got... I'm not saying do shakes, yeah. but like if, you, if you're if you not been able to manage the, yeah. the, the grammage there, just just get it well, in. Well, that's the whole thing with like a whey, whey protein. It's, you know, to supplement, so it, it can supplement your diet. So you know, if you're struggling to get that in, because it's like, that's the thing with whey protein, the fights are working. They say, oh, should not be having protein, but we're hitting it, we're hitting them targets yeah, with food, so with food. don't really need to. You know, if you... This might just be a fucking old school story that I heard in school, but can your body not digest only 30 grams of protein per... It's all, it's all really dependent on, like, the individual, and it's not like you digest that protein and just goes nowhere. It goes to other processes in the body, so um, it's kind of a little bit of a... Not a myth, but right. it goes to other processes apart from, like, you know, Build and repair the muscle and proteins. Got it. Um, but yeah, just getting that, you know, spreading your protein out. That's an important thing. A lot of people have skewed protein intake, so they have like littlest amount of protein in the day uh, in for breakfast, and then they'll have, you know, moderate amount in the, the lunch, and then they'll have the biggest amount for the dinner. It's all about just balancing out. So we're having like 30 grams for breakfast, 30 grams for lunch, 30 grams for snack. Yeah. Basically, I'm saying when I was bodybuilding, I was just mad religious. I used to have a timer every two hours. Yeah. Like yeah, when I go back to it, I was just super disciplined. I used to yeah. do weird shit looking back, like blend tune. Uh, probably all wrong. But like yeah. me having limited amount of knowledge, I just wanted to get as many calories in and get as big as I yeah. could. And protein being the main. Well, calories being the priority yeah. and then protein the being protein, the probably yeah. second priority. Yeah. I just used to get it in every two hours and that was like religion on a timer. I think it's hard. To do it's it. definitely hard to <clears throat> 
to put on, especially for a fighter, it'd be hard to put on weight because you're training that amount every day. And it's inevitable if you if, you, if you're in a calorie surplus, mm. you, you are going to put on a little mm. bit of fat, and it, that's probably the hardest. I don't have it that happen a lot, but like trying to like move up a weight, it's sometimes a little bit difficult because yeah. it's hard to control and like how many calories. I suppose when they're training that much, even doing any sort of hypertrophy training where they're trying to build lean muscle, yeah. it's difficult for them because they're already just they've got to keep the skill set up, yeah. the cardio base there, and it's. That's probably a bit of an ad. Yeah, thing and to it's manage. like it's a side of things where like you've got to then look at the S and C side of things. What they're doing right there. It's all me give uh, all um all good of me giving them the food, but what they do and training wise mm. to to help with that. You know, because if they're just lifting heavy weights, you know, with John the trainer, they do an end specific because they might get you know stiffness in the in the tendons and then you know all, all stuff like that. So um, that's probably like the hardest part moving up a weight class. I found that with some of the friends who I've got as, as fighters as well, is they've got, um, they just want to dig the hole too deep, if that makes sense. They yeah. want to just overcook it. They want to overtrain. Yeah. And then they don't well, really focus on the the replenishment, the yeah. nutrition, the stress, the sleep, well, all these fighters components. fighters like most over, overtrained you think? fighters. Yeah, 100%. 100%. Like, it's like... A, a kind of warrior mentality. Why well, I did this today, yeah, and then agreed. you see people on Instagram they're <laughs> slamming the medicine balls and they're wringing out the sweat, and the, this is what I do. It's like just you don't really need to do that. I, I work with a guy in Perth. He's a doctor. Um, he's like a hydration expert, but he's also a exercise physiologist. So I was working with one of his fighters that he does all his conditioning with. And like you expect it to be like he's three times a day this, this, and this. It's like twice a day, once in the morning, once that. When he's doing all those lifts, simple lifts, like not this overcrowded. Barely even to, getting a sweat on as well. Yeah, just just doing the fundamental when he's doing like his strength training. It's simple compound lift. It's not run with a medicine ball on your back with a you know carrying a weight vest and you know holding some dumb. It's just like simple stuff of people kind of like overcomplicate yeah. things. And um, this is a guy who fights at a decent level, and I think fighters think I need to just train, 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 train. And that's when you just get absolutely the knackered during yeah. the week. Yeah, and you want to peak for the fight, don't you? Yeah. I always thought this with this. You're peaking for one day. Yeah. It's not like you, you're doing a preseason in rugby where there's going to be a six months yeah. of, of playing and six months of sort of downtime and getting your body correct. Yeah. This is peaking for one day. And I think this is probably where it's going to be the next bit of good research is, is that condition side of things at MMA and just combat fighters in general. Because you see it's quite... You see, uh, there's not disrespecting like S and C coach, but you see some and like looks like it's just they're not really an S and C coach, and they've got these fighters and they're doing all these mad exercises. Like, how is that really like sport specific? Do you think we, we do a little bit of S and C together? Do you think working to the time constraints is the fight is key? So if you've got a 15 yeah. minute fight or a, a 10 minute fight or a 30 minute fight, being able to work to that intensity, I think definitely if you're you know because it's high intensity, this is obviously not. You know my area of expertise, but you want to be trying to mimic that scenario. So you're in your spar and stuff. You know you got to be that height. You got to keep that. You know that's why it's important to monitor your heart rate. So you're hitting that them high heart rates because that's where you're going to be hitting when you're in a fight and the recovery periods. There's a lot of good um, UFC PI data where they do it. Um, have you seen like VO two max test? Mm -hmm. So I, I've got the kit that does the VO two max test. Done it with Joe before. And you just think called like heart rate recovery. So once you've finished the test, we see then how quick does your heart rate go back to normal values, and that's a that's a determinant how fit you are. And they've got all UFC data where nice. they've got the whole weight whole weight divisions and what's good, what's bad, what's poor, and then you can compare that. Then so when I test my fighters doing that, I can see like in comparison to their weight class, and it's like getting them little like them little things like that. It's it's data driven as well. Yeah, it's then, it? it's, it's, it's you, data you know, that you know you know that kind of thing, and it's not just you know standing on one leg on a yeah, medicine ball yeah. and, and do it like I think it, it try to kind of look fat, kind of look fancy, and then this is this what this guy said to me. Well, the doctor work with him. Like sometimes you just need to be strip it back, work smarter, not harder, do the do the right things, and you don't need to be training three four times a day. Mm. 
But then, yeah, I think probably people, an ego thing for some people. Then. Oh yeah, you, as I said, you see, you're like this ringing out the sweats and mm. doesn't necessarily. This is not, that's another funny topic because you does see look cool that, on Insta though. Yeah, the, 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 the sweat, the ringing out the sweat, but and not replenishing is, it. This is a funny thing about <laughs> I'm it. It doesn't, it doesn't. The amount you sweat doesn't necessarily mean how hard you've trained because if you're in a in a gym for example, you sweat loads. It just means like the sweat can't evaporate from your skin. So it sticks to your skin and that's why it doesn't go because it can't evaporate because yeah. there's no ventilation. So when you see like, oh, that, that, that's what I mean you worked harder. Yeah. Humidity. So you, you, could, you, could, you could have two people working exactly. To, and they like, yeah. Um, I find that quite funny because like everyone just seems to think, oh, look at me, macho. You mentioned the polar heart rate there. Yeah. There's so much technology out there now. There's, yeah. I got rid of my Fitbit. You're fucking missing. I want to sleep in four hours. I just chucked it in, bim. Yeah. There, there's not much... Not a lot, a lot of solid oh, research. Have you seen these? The rings and stuff. Aura yeah. rings. Oh, bollocks. Keep, keeping on that polar strap topic, I've just bought one and I use yeah. it, but I'm not using it properly, am I really? I think I just set it up. He likes yeah. to have it on, yeah. I like to have it yeah. on and then I come on and I say, what my average heart rate, well, how many calories I've burned in that short amount of time. Yeah. I don't really pay attention to what zones I'm working in yeah. and how often I'm working in them. Yeah. Do you do you know much about it? Can you give me any advice yeah, on that? Yeah, in terms of zone, it all really depends on what you what you're trying to aim for. Like if you're doing like you're doing pads or boxing, it's gonna be high intensity. So you're gonna be in like you probably push on like zone four. So yeah, it's in a in a kind of fighter example, you wanna be hitting them high zones and maintaining that for as long as you can. Um but for if you just if you can't just lift and weight, there's not really kind of specific training zone you should re- I, from what I know that you should really be targeting like. Um, so I need to start studying. I think. I'm... Well, that one interesting point in regard to being able to get the data from the PI. Yeah, can, is, so that, I, is, that, I, is that accessible from public or just? Yeah, this is the US CPI Journal Volume Two. It's about a thousand page thing. It's it's got everything. So everything from um, someone comes from the test and they do. So they got like a battery of tests. The UFC. So we did this with Jack, the guy who worked in the UFC in Perth. She so went into the lab. That doctor guy I was telling about. And we did the UFC battery of tests and we compared his da- his data. Compared to all the UFC welterweights, and like his VO2 max was like the best in his weight category. Nice. His strength was a, was like average. So then you go, okay, well, we know he needs to work on his strength. This guy, we need to do a bit more strength work. So then his S and C guy gave him strength work to work on. You know, so it's quite cool to see that because you're not just guessing. Then you need to be on the level of Hamza. Then that's what we're going to find his day, <laughs> and we'll go from. But there. then it's quite <laughs> difficult because not everyone's got access to go to a uni and do them kind of tests. Yeah. So it's quite it's quite hard, but. Anyone who's kind of like that, you know, high level, I try and encourage them to get into a lab and do some. Do you think there's a balance point? Uh, what I've found, again, just from watching uh, boxing and watching combat sport in general, you've got probably two schools of thought. You've got some people who are old school, no yeah. heart rate monitor, don't yeah. track, go off field. They've probably got a, a coach who's very old school. Yeah. Then you've got the new school age, it's all data driven, da 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 da, whatever it might be here. Is there, is there probably the balance in the I middle? I think there's got to be a balance in between. Like, you can't be, as I said, like, you can't be overloading with data to these fighters. Like, I was saying about having video calls, fighters don't care. Like, just give me a food plan that, like, that, as long as it's right. So, I think there's got to be a kind of balancing act in the middle. And it's sometimes, especially with my line of work, it, you, because you know that information, you. You sometimes forget that some of these fighters don't care about that. What what's that? What's my heart rate zone relevant to me or my VO two max relevant to me? How does that? Yeah, and it, it's trying to convey that, um, and yeah, not overcomplicating things. But I think luckily now, even guys like bad coming like Richard and Lisa, like they they listen to what you give and they they're open to your advice and. I think a lot more coaches are open to that now because it's it is an emerging field. I think maybe like five, ten years ago they'd be like, "Fuck this guy with his notepad, with his, his yeah. degree from university." Uh, like we do it our way. This is how we do it, kind yeah. of thing. And I think when you get a result too, when you work with the fighter and they're like, they put the trust in it and they see the result, yeah, the they social see, proof. They, then yeah, they they see the way they a lot easier in the past or the body composition or the performance. Then they go, "Okay, we'll." What, what we're doing is right then and you kind of put your trust into you. Before we close off, is there any fighters out there who you're coaching who we should keep an eye out for who are going to be, you know, 
big stars. I know you've got Amber. Is it, do you help Joe as well? Yep, Joe. You've got those Amber, two. Fights. They're on this week on Amber's Friday or Saturday morning our time. Joe's Saturday. Um, got two lads on in one championship the week after next. Nathan Bender and Nico Crullo. That would be really good for nice. me to watch. Um, I always like to know if they like people coming through who a, should sort of keep an eye out for. In terms of, um, I've got really good guys in MMA fighter called Mark Ewan. He's just got a Bellator contract. He's 4-0. and um, Pro, he's going to be really good. He, he, they find it really hard for him to get fights at the moment because no one wants to fight him. He's going <laughs> nice. to be really good. Um, Have you worked with... Um... Scouse lad is a probably about twenty year old. I think his second name's Campbell. I think I've seen him. Curtis is and he's Curtis, got glasses. I've seen one, yeah. him. Yeah, yeah. I've been watching him a little bit. I saw that. I think you follow each other. Or yeah. I just wonder um, if you'd worked with him. Do you watch know weird? I don't work with like any scouts. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Don't make any scouts. I don't want at the same time. I don't really mind. <laughs> but it came back like hearing the scouts voice. Like, oh. yeah. how much of a nightmare would it be to be Paddy's nutritional coach with what he does? <laughs> Do you know what I've heard though? I I don't know his nutritious person, but I know he I is. I bet it's and not like, as bad as you think. I, I, it's not as apparently it's not as bad as you think. You know, so I think he just look. Yeah, it's just yeah. But when he's got fucking up. twenty kilos to cut off, do you know. Yeah. And is yeah. there any, any truth that these are called cat wigs? In Liverpool, is this a thing? Or? It was a thing. I don't know if it's a thing right. anymore. All right. I'm just like, like, a, like a few years ago, before I left Australia, everyone had the kettle. Get work. Big, massive I might try a fucking grow one. I'm, too, I'm too grey, me. I'd be, I'd, 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 I'd look a like a homeless kettle, yeah, <laughs> <laughs> Give us um, a bit of a call to action, some plugs. Where can people find out about more information about you? Any social um, media? This website? Probably the best way is Instagram. Condition Nutrition should be the first person that pops up. Um... My website, conditionnutrition.org, but I'm mostly active on Instagram, so if anyone wants to message me, any the man. advice, just drop me a message. Appreciate Excellent. your time. Cheers. Pleasure. Pleasure. Good work, boys. Thank you, mate. I know I got religion. I belong to the noisy crew. <laughs> you see, we shout when we get happy. That's the way we Christians do. Oh! Have you been have you been tried in that fire? I have bullets sing higher than Mariah and choir. Spent a lot of time trapping, now I'm trying to retire. But it runs in my blood and I'm the guy they require. Yeah, these guns don't bring nothing but prison and death still. All my just admire the fire. Bro, squeeze any miss, but we admire a child. Finesse kid, you can never lie to a liar. Fred got the fire.